from a trip to visit family in Minnesota. Um, so for the announcements for today, um, we're basically just continuing as we have been since the coronavirus began. Um, uh, we're not meeting together yet, but uh, we would really appreciate your prayers for wisdom as to how to continue in the future here as the school year is starting here in a couple weeks and we are anticipating some updates from the governor as to how to proceed from that. So huge prayers for that would be very welcome. Um, other than that, I encourage you to rise and greet each other. <laughs> I haven't met you yet. This is my chance. Are you shaking hands? Oh, it's nice. I'm just I'm just I'm just I'm just I'm just I'm <laughs> Hi. Very good. Sunday or is growing. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Let's begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll begin with prayer. O oh Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray that you would open our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that at the preaching of your word we may be taught to repent of our sins to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us, for Christ's sake. Amen. There's a Bible verse about to appear on the screen. Let's read it together. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He, he is, is to be, to be feared, feared above, above all God. gods. Amen. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in, glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of life. To his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me, he keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. and sweet cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet plunge in today and be made complete glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood applied Glory to his name. 
Great to see you here today and welcome in Jesus' name. Join with me as we come before the Lord in the confession of our sins. Almighty God, our, our maker, maker and redeemer, redeemer we, we poor, poor sinners, sinners confess to you that, that we are, are by nature sinful and unclean, and, unclean, and that, that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then the wonderful promise from God's word in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a wonderful promise. Let's join together in the next hymn. During this time of uh, self-imposed exile, <laughs> I trust that uh, you're using some of that extra time for prayer. I think in our nation, in my lifetime, I haven't known of a time, and of course I was very small during World War II, but uh, I think the issues today are even more serious than then. And uh, how we need to be knit together in prayer for God's people to be revived, to be refreshed, to be encouraged. And for the lost people all around us, that they may hear the word of God. And I hear interesting comments, and Pastor Dan has mentioned that, of people tuning in 
on our uh, Wi-Fi, whatever it's called, broadcast means, uh, of new people listening. And I've heard that in a number of places, and thank God for that. Uh, God has marvelous ways of taking what we see as calamity and turning it into a blessing. <coughs> Join with me as we come in before the Lord in prayer. Father God, this morning, we are again are so grateful to you for your goodness, your love, and your mercy. And even in the midst of this critical time, we know that you are at work. You are touching hearts, drawing people to yourself. And we praise you for that. And Lord, we pray today for those of your children in parts of the world where the enemy is really uh, going after them. Think of India, particularly. Also in regions of China. And uh, we even see expressions of it here in our own country. God, we cry out to you for your mercy, your wisdom, that we may know how to live and how to hold up the light in these dark days. Father, bless your word to our hearts this morning. And as we are gathered here, we're mindful of your children gathered in places all across our nation and around the world. Be present to richly bless, to nurture, and strengthen, to work conviction, revival. Father, we think today, too, of those who are dealing with illness. We think of Carol James again and pray that you would touch her with your healing hand. Thank you, Lord, for the, your marvelous answers to prayer for Susan and for Seth. Uh, who have come through very, very difficult situations this past week. We praise you for that. Pray for Jean up in Minnesota that you will just lead and guide with the back ailment that he has to deal with. Lord, uh, others who have varied needs today. And again, we lift up to you many of our friends who are struggling with the cancer issue. Lord, uh, we pray that you will meet them in their special need in a very special way. Lord, uh, cleanse our hearts from sin. Deepen us in our faith and trust in you. And we pray for our schools today as some of them are starting and class again tomorrow and the struggle and the concerns about that. Lord, keep your hand over our schools, protect the children, protect the teachers, and work out all of the details that relate to it. Pray for a governor that you will give him very special wisdom, and guidance as he seeks to give direction in these situations for a president as well for others who are in leadership. Lord, we pray for police departments who are under fire these days so unjustly. Lord God, we pray that you will encourage them, strengthen them. And I pray that you would uh, silence some of these uh, forces that are rising up to try to uh, upset all kinds of things. So, Lord, we look to you. You are the great God. You are over all things. And we thank you that we can look to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This time we'll bring our offerings before the Lord. And if you forgot to leave your offering at the door, you can leave it there when uh, church is over. Lord, again, we bless your holy name for the wonderful way in which you provide for us. Meet us in our special needs and receive these gifts and bless them to your kingdom's glory.
Amen. Our scripture lesson today is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 16 through 24. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him. He's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Isn't that a pretty good description of today's time? think it is. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of the mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. God's word. Would you stand with me and join in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And welcome back to Eli and Liz. So glad to have you here. And uh, join with them as we sing the next song. How old were you the last time you sang that one? <laughs> you ever notice that the songs we learned in Sunday school contain some of the most profound truths of Scripture? And that's a good thing. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have given us your word. We thank you that we can come to you in every moment of need that we can find in your word 
the perfect revelation of you and that you've made yourself clear. We pray that you give us understanding this morning as we approach your word in Jesus' name. Amen. The verses we just read from Matthew chapter 11 are uh, kind of a mystery. I, uh, there are phrases in there that I've wondered about for years. And so I prepared a sermon and had it all ready to print out yesterday. And the Lord said, uh-uh. Throw that one away. Approach it like a Bible study. I've got something different. <laughs> so here we are. Matthew chapter 11. This chapter starts out with, the apost with, with John the Baptist sending some of his disciples to ask Jesus a question. John is in prison. He might be beheaded at any time, and in fact, shortly he was beheaded. Shortly he was beheaded. <laughs> that's, I'm sorry, that's a terrible pun. Um, and he knew it. He, he knew this could happen at any time. He was in the hands of this capricious despot named Herod. And... Um, so he was having some doubts. He was the one who had baptized Jesus and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But in prison, he's beginning to wonder if he was on the right track or what. And so he sends some of his disciples to Jesus and says, are you the one who was to come or should, be we, should we be waiting for somebody else? And then Jesus doesn't give a direct answer to the disciples of John. He tells them to stand by and watch. And after a little while, he says, okay, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. This is in verse four. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the, dead, uh, the deaf hear and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is he who finds no offense in me. In other words, he tells them, go tell John what you're seeing here. <laughs> Nothing like it has ever happened before. Just go tell him what you've seen and let him come to his own conclusions. That was enough. You know, it's funny, Jesus very rarely actually said, I am the Messiah. He'd said it a few times. The first time was to the woman at the well. You remember to the Samaritan woman? She wasn't even Jewish. I who speak to you am he, he told her when she confessed that she was waiting for the Messiah to appear. But when it came to John the Baptist, he didn't say, believe it, I'm, I'm the Messiah. He just said, come to your own conclusions. Watch and see. And then as the disciples of John are leaving, Jesus turns to the crowd and says, what did you all go out into the desert to see? And he's a little bit sarcastic. He says, were you going out there to see a, a reed shaken by the wind? You out there watching the plants blow in the wind? What were you all going out there to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Should have been in Herod's palace if you wanted to see that. What did you go out to see? Was it a prophet? And he says, yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he, John is he of whom it was written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. And then he says one of his truly, truly, I say to you statements, that, that statement that we're so familiar with that says, what I'm about to say is so wonderful, you're going to have a hard time with it, but it's the truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And then he goes on and says, the prophets prophesied up to John. John was the last Old Testament prophet.
but now the kingdom of God has come. And then we start the verses that we just read, starting in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 11. We, to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. He's referring to a, a children's game that was common at that time. The children would go with their parents to the marketplace. They didn't have childcare facilities, so the kids stayed with their parents. And while the parents were busy in the marketplace, the kids kind of gathered in, in hordes, I suppose, <laughs> and played games. And of course, like kids all over the world, they played the games that they saw adults doing and they had a game that was kind of like a cross between Simon Says and uh, Follow the Leader. And this was a very common game where one group of kids would be the leaders and they would pretend to play the flute like they had seen adults do in a wedding ceremony or a reception. And the other kids were supposed to dance look happy like they were in a wedding ceremony. And then they would switch and they would start singing a dirge and the others would have to go from wedding mode to funeral mode and start crying and wailing and waving their arms around like they had seen adults do at funerals. So it, you can imagine how much fun the leaders would have with that. Kind of like Simon says, up, up, you took two steps. I didn't say Simon says and all that stuff. Try to catch the others doing the wrong thing. But he said, in this case, you've got one group of kids that are calling the shots and the others just aren't responding. We played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't weep. What's going on? You're not following the rules. You're not responding. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look at him a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of, of tax collectors and sinners. So he says, John came preaching the law, calling people to repentance, and you didn't respond. I came preaching the gospel and calling you to receive God's forgiveness and have a life changed by the power of God's grace, and you didn't respond to that either. You're not listening. <clears throat> and then he says, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And that's a mysterious statement to be tagged on to the end of that criticism of their lack of response to God's call. They didn't respond to the law. They didn't respond to the gospel. There was no repentance. There was no faith. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. It seems that he was quoting an old proverb. Even the wording of it is kind of like when we speak in King James English and quote the book of Proverbs. It's, it, it's an ancient wording. Um, the word justified is not the normal word for justified, to, to make righteous or to declare righteous. It's a word that really means something more along the order of, of uh, to be uh, to be verified, to be proven true. Wisdom is, is verified. Wisdom is, is proven true by her deeds. When Luke quotes this same statement of Jesus, he, he puts it, yet wisdom is justified by all her children. And it seems that the Aramaic word that Jesus used could be translated into Greek either way. The the deeds produced by wisdom, the children produced by wisdom, it's all one and the same thing. The offspring of wisdom verifies that it's really wisdom. And these people were saying, we're wise. We don't need John the Baptist to tell us to repent. We already know all this stuff. We don't need Jesus to come and declare forgiveness to us. We already know this stuff. We're cool. We're good. We don't need your help. Thank you very much. And so even though God the Son was there doing un 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 indescribable miracles in their midst, they yawned and went about their business as though they hadn't seen anything. No response. The arrogance and the pride 
and the spiritual or religious, religious self-sufficiency in which they lived betrayed them. So then Jesus goes on in verse 20, he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Now the funny thing is he mentions a couple of cities there and we only know of a couple of miracles that Jesus did in Bethsaida. He healed the blind man outside of the town of Bethsaida. Chorazin isn't even mentioned again. It's just kind of brought up here. But it was a town very close to Bethsaida and to Capernaum. They were all in one district there near Galilee. And uh, it says most of his mighty works had been done in these towns. John, in John's gospel, when he's describing the work that Jesus did, he says, the Lord did many other things that are not even written in this book. I suppose if everything that Jesus did were written down, the whole world wouldn't contain the books that would have to be written. But these things are written that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And so God led his, his, his disciples, his apostles, to write down just enough of the things that Jesus did so that we can see who he is and come to faith in him. Wisdom is justified by her deeds. The, the things that Jesus did revealed the truth of who he was so that they should have been able to just see it there's there's no need to to explain it because look at what's happening wisdom is justified by her deeds he doesn't he doesn't have to defend himself to John the Baptist and explain why things are the way they are John just has to look and see what's happening and he'll see the wisdom of God displayed in God the Son who had come to do these things that no one else had ever been able to do before or since. Only the Son of God could do them. Only the Messiah was capable of this kind of thing. He says to, he says, woe to you, Chorazin, Woe to you, Bethsaida. These were two towns about six miles apart. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Tyre and Sidon were two cities in Phoenicia, just north of Israel, which is now Lebanon. And Jesus actually went to that district at one point. You remember he delivered a, a girl who was the daughter of a Phoenician, Syro-Phoenician woman and um, who had, was uh, demon-possessed. And that was about all he did there that we know of. I mean, there's nothing else is mentioned. He might, it seems like miracles seemed to happen wherever Jesus went, so there might have been a lot of other things happening. But he didn't do the miracles that he did in Galilee. And the people didn't respond. He says, if I had done the miracles that you've seen up in Tyre and Sidon, those pagans would have repented long since. But you're not responding. And then he says, I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. You know, we've been talking as we went through the book of Romans in our Wednesday evening Bible study that we're judged according to the light we've been given. And he's saying, you, you have had God the Son doing miracles in your midst. You, you've seen the hand of God working, the wisdom of God displayed and proven before your eyes, and you haven't responded. These pagans, if they had, if they had seen the things done that you've seen done, they would have responded. And of course, then we want to say, well, then why didn't he go and preach in Tyre and Sidon? Why did he waste his time with these, with these hard-headed people in Galilee who weren't going to respond? And he knew it. Well, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. 
we're not allowed to ask why. Or we can ask all we want, <laughs> but we're not going to get an answer. God doesn't have to explain himself to us. That's the message of the book of Job. Job started asking, why God? Why are you allowing all these terrible things to happen to me? And God's answer was basically, I don't have to explain myself to you. You just have to learn to trust me no matter what. That's the way it works. Well, the Syrian church, which was raised up immediately after the time of Christ in the time of the apostles, is still there today, still in Lebanon. You know that Lebanon was 50% Christian up until about 20 years ago? Today it's about 12% Christian because the Christians in Lebanon have been persecuted so severely. Many of them have been killed. Many of them have been scattered around the world, getting out of the persecution that's going on there in Lebanon. Lebanon is currently pretty much run by a whole bunch of terrorist groups that are shooting at each other half the time, but the most influential one is Hezbollah, which is supported by Iran, and they pretty much own the government. That's what's happening there. But up until very recently, Lebanon, there were a lot of Christians from the time of the apostles until now. They responded when the gospel was preached to them. And then verse 23, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. The old King James says, you will be brought down to hell. And that's a pretty good, pretty good translation. We can talk about Hades and hell and all that in, in some Bible class going on. It can be translated either way. It means the place of the unrighteous dead, sometimes called Gehenna or hell. Right? When we say Jesus descended into hell, that's where he went. Not to be punished, but to proclaim his victory in that place of the unrighteous dead. But he says, you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. You know, he's quoting the book of Isaiah here. And it's really interesting. If you've got a Bible in front of you, turn to Isaiah chapter 14. And um, we'll read that passage. And you can tell me who he's talking to here. Isaiah chapter 14, starting at verse 12. <clears throat> How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of dawn. Who's he talking to? Somebody named Lucifer? The ESV says, O day star, son of dawn. That's what Lucifer translates to. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will set, sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Sheol is the Hebrew name for the word Hades in Greek, the place of the dead. You will be brought down to hell. And so Jesus, or I'm, God speaking through Isaiah, calls Lucifer out and says, in your pride, in your arrogance, you thought that you could take the place of God on the throne of heaven. But because of your pride and your arrogance, you will be cast down to hell instead. And he quotes that verse to the people of Capernaum. Capernaum was a town on the edge of the sea. It was kind of the base of operations for Jesus and, and his disciples during those three and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry. The name Capernaum means the village of Nahum. That's apparently where Nahum had his ministry way back in the Old Testament. 
And so the people were very proud of their religious heritage, and they felt that they had it all. They had such a history of, of this great prophet of God from the Old Testament that Jesus really couldn't contribute much to them. They had no need to respond in repentance and faith. And the miracles that Jesus did among them were ho-hum. And there was no response. And so he compares their pride and their arrogance to the pride and arrogance of Satan. And says, your pride and your arrogance, you think you're being exalted to heaven because you are in such a lofty position in your religion, but it's taking you to hell because you don't respond to the word of God. That's a pretty powerful citation, isn't it? <clears throat> For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. What was Sodom? Sodom was that place in Abraham's day where God rained down fire and brimstone because of the wickedness that had become so extreme in that city that God decided they couldn't be allowed to stay on the earth because their wickedness would be propagated and duplicated in the rest of the human race. And they had to be destroyed. He gave them time to repent. He sent Lot to be there and be a witness among them. And still, they didn't respond until finally God had to destroy them by fire and brimstone. <clears throat> and Jesus says, if, if the miracles that, that you have seen, Capernaum, had been done back in Sodom, back in Abraham's day, that city would have repented and they'd still be there. But now there's nothing but ashes. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. God doesn't seem to think much of religious arrogance and pride, does he? <laughs> You're judged by the light you've been given. Again, there's this, this rule that we've heard many times, light received brings more light. Light rejected brings darkness, right? And if we reject the word of God, darkness falls. Now that's the end of the, uh, of the official script, scripture reading for today. It ends right there. And that's a pretty grim note to end on, isn't it? Too bad because it goes on <laughs> in this chapter. And the chapter ends with Jesus praying and saying, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. The wise and understanding, those who think they are wise and understanding, make themselves judges of the word of God instead of allowing the word of God to judge their hearts. We'll analyze the Bible and explain why it doesn't mean what it actually says. To get ourselves out from under the convicting of the Holy Spirit. And that happens a lot in religious circles. But the proper response is the response of a little child whose father has been speaking to him. Whether to correct him or whether to declare his love the child's heart responds. You have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children, Father. Those are the people to whom God reveals himself as they respond to his word. The ones who respond with the faith of little children. 
Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. God chooses those who will hear and respond in his sovereign grace. Such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then he follows with that wonderful promise. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If the word of God has had its effect so that God's law has burdened you with the awareness of your sin and it's become so heavy that you can't carry it, come to Jesus and I will give you rest, he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let God's word, let God's word have its effect in your heart. Where God calls out our sin, receive it, confess it, recognize it, and lay the burden down at the feet of Jesus and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light, he says. God works through his word. He reveals himself, he reveals his will. He reveals what's wrong and what's right. He shows us our sin. He gives us grace to understand and respond to his call to repent. And the moment we turn in repentance, we receive this wonderful message of grace and forgiveness. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest you'll find rest for your souls. Now this is what Jesus wanted to say all along to those people in Capernaum and, and Bethsaida and Chorazin and everywhere else. But until his law has its effect, our hearts are unable to respond to his offer of forgiveness. How are you responding to God's call of repentance and his offer of forgiveness? Let both have their full effect in your life. Let Jesus draw you to himself and give you the rest that he offers. Lord Jesus, we pray this morning that you would deliver us from thinking that we don't need anything from you, that we've got it all figured out. We pray, Lord, that your call to conviction of sin and repentance would have its effect in our hearts. Deliver us from arrogance and pride. And Lord Jesus, let the sweet words of your forgiveness, your offer of rest, sink into our hearts this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Will you pray with me as 
we join together in the words that Jesus taught us. Would you stand as we pray? <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive this blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our worship has ended. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.